Hello, everyone. Can y'all hear me? Yes. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> Never sure with these things. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Um, we're just getting started now and allow people to continue to join. Um, my name is Allison Parker, and I am a board member for the Citizen Science Association. So I'm really pleased to host this webinar for the Citizen Science Association. Um, I'll just give a very brief introduction to this webinar and our presenter, um, as well as uh, CSA itself. And then we'll get, get started. Um, so we are in the second of four webinars hosted by our ethics working group. Move forward on um, yes, yeah, so we're in the, in the second of four webinars hosted by the FX Working Group, which is a really valuable addition to the set of resources we're building for all of us working in citizen science. Um, and these webinars uh, are helping us all to engage with ethical practices in our work in citizen science and start and continue the discussion uh, within CSA members membership about ethical work in our field. So thanks so much to the Ethics Working Group for putting this series of webinars together, um, and we're really looking forward to the one today. Uh, just as we get started, I wanted to remind us all about the Citizen Science Association, um, and that we are bringing people together from many different contexts to advance the practice of citizen science. And so some of our main goals include providing access to tools and resources as well as providing access to communication and, and professional development like this webinar. Um, so we've launched this series of webinars uh, and many of them are powered by our working groups, uh, including this series of, of webinars from the ethics working group. And so collectively, the goal is to um, advance these ideas within our community. Um, there are some additional webinars coming up in this excellent series. There was one last month that was an introduction to citizen science ethics. Um, and then in early 2019, we'll have a webinar on transparency and then following that a webinar on ethics review. So we'll look forward to those as well. Um, for a little bit of information on working groups. Uh, these are largely self-organized components of the Citizens, sorry, Citizen Science Association, um, and they address various cross-cutting issues in this field, um, including things like ethics, education, data and metadata, professional development, and more. Um, so you can find these working groups on the CSA website. I just wanted to note quickly that the website is still in a bit of flux right now after a hack, but um, most of the material on the working groups, I believe, is up and running. Um, and also please visit the resources page, which I'll put in the chat in a minute, or maybe Chris um, can put um, that link in the chat uh, for some resources for the ethics working group. Um, and you can find the recording for this webinar as well as the previous webinar on the CSA channel in YouTube which we will also add the link in a minute. Um, and just a note, another note on working groups that um, for any of, of you out there that are interested in starting an, a new working group, that is also an option and there's material on that on the website as well. Okay, so now just a quick introduction for this webinar. Um, there are too many people to accommodate audio, so you'll notice that you all um, are muted. Uh, so we'll rely on the chat box to, for the question and answer session. So please feel free to use the chat box uh, throughout the webinar, uh, including to introduce yourself, to ask a question, to make a comment. Um, and I'll be monitoring that chat box uh, for any questions for, um, for the webinar today. Um, I forgot about this slide. This, <laughs> we uh, also wanted to note that uh, this conversation will be continuing, as well as many other conversations within the field of citizen science in March uh, with the uh, Citizen Science Association Conference, which we're really excited about, March 2019 in Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, I'm sure you all are well aware of the variety of exciting things that will be happening there, including workshops and symposia, a variety of talks and events um, 
including with the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. So please check this out if you haven't already, and I believe registration will be opening very shortly. Um, okay, so um, now I will turn the webinar over to Stacy Lynn, who will be hosting our webinar today on situation assessment and stakeholder analysis for citizen science. Um, Stacy is a research scientist at Colorado State University, um, and she specializes in the social ecology of East African rageland systems and on participatory, collaborative, and citizen science approaches to engaged research, um, including with the sitsi.org development team. Um, and she's also the co-chair of the ethics working group. So I'll let her tell you more about herself and about the topic today. I guess just a quick note, Chris or Stacy, if either of you want to jump in right now and give any additional information about the ethics working group, that would be great. Hi, this is Chris. Uh, I'm going to talk first because Stacy's going to get to talk uh, for the rest of it. Um, and I uh, just wanted to say thank you so much for, for hosting us, Allison. We really appreciate it. And uh, thank everybody for, for attending. Uh, the Citizen Science Ethics Working Group is open for anybody who wants to join. Uh, I, we've given you the link to the working group and you can come join us if you wish. Um, we are not uh, claiming to be a set of authorities on ethics, but we are trying to gather together resources that'll be helpful to people. And we are trying to create, uh, facilitate this discussions that are gonna help people to be able to, to deal with the ethics and citizen science. So thank you all for helping us with that. And without further ado, here is Stacy. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm not sure if my screen is visible. I'm trying to right now. see that. Can you guys see my screen? I cannot. OK, hold on. I just have to escape out of my share. There we go. It's on the presenter view. Like, mm, I'm sorry? It's on the presenter view. Uh, hold on a second. It shouldn't have been. Give me a moment here. We did practice this, but <laughs> <laughs> oh, I see. Okay, I think I got it. There we go. There. Does that work? Yes. All right. All right. So, um, as mentioned, uh, my name is Stacy Lynn, and I work at Colorado State University as a research scientist and. My focus is on social ecology and East African pastoral systems, but I also work with the um, sit side org group here at Christian. and part of Sadberg, um, one of our main um, focuses of our work is providing a, a platform for citizen scientists to develop and lead and conduct their, their own ground up um, citizen science projects. And so I invite people to visit sitside.org to, to see a little bit more. But the reason I share that is that it, it's informing strongly um, how I'm approaching the process of situation assessment and stakeholder analysis forces in science. Um, I became interested in situation assessment and stakeholder analysis, which I call SASA. You won't find anything on SASA because I'm using that acronym myself. Um, but I developed this interest while working with the Center for Collaborative Conservation here at Colorado State. So you'll also see a strong influence of collaborative conservation in the webinar. And I'm interested in how these collaborative and thoughtful systems perspective processes can inform the success of citizen science projects in general <clears throat> by giving both project leads and participants some grounding in the context of the situation that they are studying and making the, the work more relevant to the diverse stakeholders that are involved. And sometimes these stakeholders aren't always immediately apparent or obvious. So these deliberate and thoughtful processes ensure that our work is ethical, that it's grounded in the needs of the, 
diverse stakeholders that we're working with and that <clears throat> at times the ethical um, challenges that might be hidden from our um, from our immediate view or knowledge um, are revealed to us all right so let's see here hold on my arrows aren't working there we go so why sasa why do you want to do a situation assessment and stakeholder analysis um, first of all this process provides a flexible framework for understanding the issues context and history of those issues stakeholders and their agendas um, the boundaries of interest that um, helps you to define the what the geographic and other contexts and boundaries um, of relevance are for you, um, relationships and their hierarchies, appropriate approaches and processes that are relevant to the issues that you're studying or working in. And um, it also provides an opportunity for you to frame yourself in that situation. So taking stock of your personal history, your lens, um, your biases, opinions, and such that might influence how you approach your work and how communities relate to you as an individual um, who is in their space. And that can potentially affect your project success. This process um, of situation assessment stakeholder analysis is purpose-driven, it should be inclusive, collaborative, reflective, um, educational, voluntary, you know, nobody should be forced to participate in this process. Um, it should be self-designed, so designed um, to meet the needs of the work that you're doing. It should be engaging, flexible, ongoing, so this doesn't just start and stop at the beginning of your, of your project, but should be happening continuously throughout the project as things change. Um, you should think broadly, um, be respectful through this process, accountable to your stakeholders, um, needs to be time limited and realistic. And realistic is really hard and sometimes particularly in related to time limitations and resource limitations. But it's, it is important to try to bring yourself down to the ground instead of way up in the sky. And I do have to visit this idea of collaboration and the principles of collaborative problem solving because when you think about citizen science, citizen science is, an, is a natural participatory and collaborative arrangement. And so by joining together, to, we basically do together what one could not accomplish alone. Um, and that is the, the foundation of co-labor collaboration, is doing, doing together what you cannot accomplish on your own. And I think that citizen science is really an epitome of collaboration because you're, you're pulling together not only people who you know or who may be experts in some area, but also others who just have an interest in what it is that you're doing and who wanna participate boots on the ground. Um, plus, in research and action, it's important to ensure equity of input, process, and outcome. And following a collaborative process of really deliberately, and I'll use that word deliberately a lot, um, thinking through your stakeholders and your participants will help to ensure that equity. And um, therefore, an, um, a, an ethical process um, as people are not left out. As you embark on um, a SASA, um, it's really important to take a step back from your own personal um, perspective to step out of the box that you are typically in, no matter how broadly you think, going through this process of situation assessment and stakeholder analysis really helps you to go further in this process by giving you a, a holistic view of um, what it is that you're studying and how it is how it is situated in a broader context and one of the ways that you can best get 
at this large picture, this bigger picture view of the situation is by talking to people, by engaging with your volunteers, by ensuring that you're making yourself as aware of po as possible of the various stakeholders who have an interest in what you're doing. Um, nobody likes to be left out of a process that they have an interest in. And so that's one of the reasons this is so important. And then reevaluating is something that really needs to be done along the way because as you uncover new information um, that may help to re help you to reframe the way that you are um, looking at the situation and the stakeholders. So taking a, a systems approach um, is the foundation to um, to being able to frame your, your work in this broader context. So your goal is to step back, to look at the framing, look at this bigger picture and the context of your question or questions at hand by engaging with and assessing the networks and inter interrelationships between systems components and, and the people themselves and the broader system that you'll be working in, as well as looking at the utility of the work that you plan to do or are doing. And so this can include beyond your particular goals, there may be broader applications and unintended potential consequences of the work that you're doing that can be revealed through this process. And I, I'd really like to focus on that unintended consequences piece because often the negative consequences of research or of um, activities and actions are a result of not being aware of some component of the system, something that is relevant, but maybe you didn't think it was relevant or hadn't thought about that before. And so taking this process will help to reveal some of these things so that you don't fall into that trap of unintended consequences, um, which we'll get back to a little bit later. So we'd like to you for you to think about the situation that you are studying um, how you have approached it so far, and what happens when you step back to change your framing, to expand your networks and engage with a broader set of stakeholders, um, and thinking about the broader utility of the work that you're doing. And a lot of the way that I'm framing this is very broad, and that's because there are so many different types of citizen science projects that it's really hard for me to, to dig into language that may more specifically relate to your, your project. So some citizen science projects are, are just looking at basic science or collecting some, um, some bit of information about the local system or environment, but don't have, um, any intention of creating political change. Um, and so I, I want to be open to all different types of, of projects as we go through this. So when citizen science projects are all based on a problem or an interest that someone or some group identifies. So if you're if you're a, a lead in a project, a project, um, a program director, a coordinator, um, and the dreams and hopes of building knowledge and potential possibly affecting change. And this is your citizen science issue or effort. And while many projects may have a goal of influencing change, like I said, such as policy, um, you know, you have those others that might just be interested in increasing knowledge of, around a particular topic, and that's fine. Um, but citizen science projects don't exist in a vacuum. Um, informing ourselves of the context of our interests and the work forms the foundation for ethical approaches in our work and involving the right people and using the right processes, peeling back our lenses to broaden how we think about the issues, all of that is, is really important to affecting these, these changes. And the first thing um, that we wanna consider is power. So power imbalances um, can, within a situation such as between groups of people or power imbalances that are set up in your project where you are seen to be in power um, that may affect your, those things may affect your relationships, but power imbalances can also lead to um, say risk and participation um, and risk and participation by people who may be um, 
disempowered because of um, other aspects of the system. And so um, there's also things such as hazards, such as weather or wildlife or volunteers taking a solitary hike. Um, these things can also lead to issues of safety and security um, for your volunteers and also for participants. Safety and security of um, human and animal study subjects is important. Um, Politics brings a complicating dimension and context to research and to action. Everybody knows how it is to um, sit around a, the Thanksgiving table with people who have different political views from you and how uncomfortable that can be. And when you're working to affect change, um, these politics come into play and being aware of those politics is, is very important. Um, so you can navigate that system. Um, let's see here. And then equity is, so by conducting a, um, a stakeholder um, analysis, that allows you to involve um, your diverse stakeholders um, on an equitable basis. I think that's very important to give everybody an opportunity to participate, giving them participation access. Um, also participation, participation access of volunteers, that's important. And meeting the needs of a diverse stakeholder and citizen science participant group. Um, these needs should be grounded in people's sense of place and having a feel for that can only come from talking to stakeholders. Um, this sense of place is informed by culture, by values, by traditions, by history, um, and all of these things, like not knowing the history of relationships, the history of power imbalances, um, the history of um, safety and security for a particular group of people because of these power issues and cultural differences. You can see how all of this can um, can affect how people participate in a citizen science project, either as active volunteers or as stakeholders in another role. Um, so another, some other things to think about are the boundaries and scale of your work. And there should be some logical sense to your boundaries and scale of your study um, so that you can clearly draw conclusions on what you're studying and, um, and to inform your, um, or to be informing for your geographic and social areas and groups of interest. Um, Economics as well are <laughs> very important to consider. And this is both important both in terms of the economic situation surrounding your issue that may have, you know, power embedded in it as well. Um, but also in terms of the resources that are available to you as the lead of a group project um, and leading citizen scientists and how what resources do you have available to you? And these resources may be human resources, but they may be financial resources. All of that is important. And I encourage you to think broadly about these things, um, as well as to think beyond the list of these system context components that I've presented here. There may be other contexts to um, the work that you yourself are doing. So what is a situation assessment? I mean, basically a situation, if you're, if you're going to define the word situation, uh, that can be defined as the issue at hand, you know, the situation that you're in, but it's also how the issue itself is situated or sits in, in the greater context of the things that we were talking about and other items as well. The assessment, um, you know, so you define your situation, but to, to assess the situation, to conduct an assessment, means asking the questions, um, what are you walking into? Um, what has happened so far and who has come before? And I mean, I guess it, it could also mean, you know, what, what do you hope to change? So why conduct a situation assessment? You know, your goal is to step inside, to look at specifics of your question and people, stakeholders, um, at hand, the interrelationships between 
system components that you're working in, and this could be the politics, the, the ecology, um, um, and all of these other um, situ parts of the situation, and also how to address the needs of multiple stakeholders, which can be very complex. And I'll get into that a little bit more in a few minutes. But you also want to, so, so that's all thinking about stepping inside your, your situation. But to, you also want to step outside of your small box of your situation to identify those broad surrounding elements that could either impact or be impacted by the um, issues or outcomes of the work that you are doing. And so one of the one of the ways I'm going to hop back a couple of um, slides here, just to to give an example of this, that if you are are conducting a study on um, say water quality, I'll be using water quality as an example um, later on as well, and you are doing uh, some water tests along a stretch of a river. Um, to, because there are concerns about water quality for a community that lives downstream from a, say, a, a, um, um, a, an agricultural scheme where, where there's um, source point pollution happening. Um, there are some power imbalances there. If you have a very powerful agro system, um, um, organization or powerful, um, I don't want to bring up particular particular names of, of companies or anything, but a particularly powerful company that's um, that has a political edge or some in with local politicians, there may be some challenges that are presented to um, cr creating change um, for the local community and their water. And so being aware of these challenges and informing people of these challenges um, is very important to, to reduce the, the potential for unintended consequences for those communities that are, are at a bit of a disadvantage to that powerful corporation and those corporate interests. So the core of a situation assessment are to ask those standard questions we all learned when we were in elementary school, um, the what, who, why, where, when, and how of, um, of your situation. Um, what are the issues and their context and history? What don't you know that you should know? And being really honest with yourself about that, um, because you don't know what's important until you know a little bit about it. You may learn a little bit and decide that this is not an area that I, I want to spend the time diving deep into, but having a, a finger on those, those issues that might be a bit to the side is very important. Um, are you asking the right questions? Sometimes we go about, and I actually find this quite a bit in my research, that I start a lot of my questions grounded in, in theory. Even though I'm grounded in place, I, I also have theoretical interests um, in my research and curiosities that I have myself. And it may take some preliminary work for me to figure out whether or not I am asking the right questions. And knowing that means talking to people and really digging into that situation. Is there conflict? Is there common ground? Um, conflict isn't always bad. It can be energizing. So um, don't always look at it as a negative. It's, there is a um, potential positive to conflict. And thinking about who has an interest, this is the stakeholder analysis. Who has an interest and what are the relationships between these people in terms of power and hierarchy there that's driven by interests, concerns, and goals? And in addition to that, who, who are your potential volunteers? Who has an interest in working with you? Um, why do these issues even exist? And why are you the person to do this work or not? Um, you and your team. And then where are the issues? How do you define these boundaries um, and span a system? When do the issues begin to form and what's the history behind them? Um, what's so important about this now? And are the issues time sensitive? This is, this is that, that time limitation piece. Um, how do you go about your work? How do you enter into 
the situation. You're coming in, you may be an insider um, already because you're part of a community, but sometimes we start citizen science projects in places where we don't live or aren't active um, um, participants in, in the local community. And so thinking about how you enter is, is really important. What is your potential for collaboration and negotiation? Your platform for interaction? Um, are you working, interacting with your volunteers online? Um, are you interacting with stakeholders online? Are you holding meetings, meetings in person? And who are you? And what's your role in moving forward? And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. So for this, you start with defining your question or issue. And I think everybody starts off with a, with a sense of what it is that they're interested in. But this process um, hopefully will help you to either become more, more secure with how you're defining that or will help to inform some shifts in how you ask your question. Um, and part of that comes about through thinking about how you defined your question, who defined it, was it you, or did somebody or community voice a concern that you are interested in addressing? And so we, we here as academics, so we may be academics, we might be practitioners, um, where whoever we are, we have our own sense of interest that drive our work, but our stakeholders should also have a part in helping to to drive our work. So once you define that um, you're questioning your interests, this is the, the zooming out piece to conduct your preliminary assessment to think about the, the background. Um, and you can do this remotely. So by doing an online search, for instance, um, initially, but then talking to people is really important. That's what I mean by the in situ full assessment is in place. Um, and that will help you to fill in gaps, to refine the way that you're framing your questions, to reevaluate yourself and your role and approach, how you fit in, to reevaluate your plan or scope. Very often this process reveals that you're thinking way too big and trying to do way too much. And so figuring out what the optimal amount of work will be is very important. This is a bit hard and tricky to do with citizen science because at times um, you, are, you do not know exactly how much data you are going to be able to collect or um, how much information you will get because the number of citizen science participants, volunteers, is unknown and where they will be collecting the data is also unknown. And so um, that's another reason why it is so very important to be um, to be adaptable to what the scenario, what um, to what is happening and, and what your successes or challenges are as you undertake your project. So, you know, reevaluate your plan and scope. And if you find that um, that you maybe are not getting the data that you were hoping to get, then that means that you need to revisit how you are recruiting your volunteers or how you are um engaging with your stakeholders because oftentimes those stakeholders are the very people who are interested in participating in a project um, another thing that is important to do as you zoom out is to revisit your assumptions and these are your values um, your relationships the context and drivers that we talked about um, and other things that surround the situation specifically and once you do that zoom back in and think about you know that spatial and geographic um, the spatial and geographic boundaries of the situation you're studying the temporal boundaries in terms of um, how long over what time period are you interested in studying um, what are the social boundaries are you working with a particular group of people ecological boundaries are you looking in a particular watershed or a particular mountain range or um, along a specific river um, and then disciplinarily are you engaging with 
people? Are you asking people questions as study subjects? Or is your project um, only working with environmental or, or other observable um, um, measurements that you can take? So that could be related to people. It could be related to traffic patterns. There are many different things that you can, you can do with citizen science. I tend to take an ecological bent um, to citizen science because that's my expertise, but, um, but there are many other, other types of projects to look at. And then when you, you can also think about when you zoom back in the role or need for collaboration. So have you identified particular stakeholders who, um, who would be good collaborators who may um, put you in touch with a potential pool of volunteers? Um, is there a platform and, which means um, an online platform for engaging or um, through an organization for engaging with your stakeholders. And if there's conflict, finding that, um, that point of common ground that may exist between two or more um, groups of stakeholders that, that find conflict between themselves, there, there's usually some point of common ground that can help to, um, to bridge the differences. And so what can collaboration bring to that process and outcome and what can you bring to the process and outcome um, as you work with your volunteers to address your, your citizen science um, project agenda? So looking at geographically mapping your situation, if you, if you have a map thinking specifically about um, your exact study area, how you want to define those boundaries, um, think about how you are actually setting these boundaries and whether um, these boundaries make ecological, social, political, and other sense. Um, or whether they're um, just randomly determined and don't have any meaning. So, so think about the meaning of the boundaries that you set so that you can do a clear situation um, assessment for that space. Um, and then think about other things that lie inside your study area and what may lie outside that could be relevant to your study. So for instance, you might be interested in looking at that, um, the pollution that's caused by a, an agricultural scheme, commercial agricultural scheme upstream from this community of interest, but there may also be a history of mining that is farther up the river from that agricultural scheme. And so that may influence the results of the water quality test um, in ways that are that are unanticipated if you do not know about um, those those upstream other upstream um, situations but there's there's other boundaries not the just the geographic ones um, those temporal boundaries social boundaries um, some people may be in conducting a citizen science project that is only interested in in women visitors to a national park and um, and how their interest in natural resources are changing over time or not. And so so there's these other boundaries um, that are that are of interest that should be considered. And then um, thinking about your arbitrary versus meaningful definitions of these boundaries and the benefits and limitations of how you've defined these. So if you are interested in, in making political change or, or affecting political change, then you'll have to be very explicit in how, you're, how you are defining all of these boundaries so that, um, so that your goals are clearly articulated. Otherwise, the, the data that and information that your citizen scientists collect may not be grounded in um, in a meaningful context. So issues are 
very personal to people's lives. And, and this is, this is true no matter what the issue is that you're studying. Um, and so because issues are so personal and because they affect different community members differently and, and people may feel different burdens and benefits as a result of, um, of situations, then, you know, th this can pre present challenges of, um, who who has the potential to gain or or lose based on um, as a result of your research um, public officials and citizens often lack close and continuous contact and, and conversation and so this disconnect between officials and and local people can lead to some challenges um, as well. And your citizen science volunteers might be unaware of the context of their work. So training or providing information and resources is important. And this, this may be just pointing them um, in the direction of, of these resources or information such as newspaper articles or, or other information or other research studies. Your stakeholders are really anyone who is affected by the outcome of a decision, conflict, or situation. And here's where we start getting into this, this stakeholder analysis piece of, of the SASA. And, you know, there's, stakeholders also value the outcome of a decision. So if you are looking to affect change, then, then that value or burden that, that these stakeholders may realize as a result um, will affect them. And so having a capacity or potential capacity to affect the outcome of a decision, that's another um, role that stakeholders play. Um, they may decide that they want to obstruct a decision or its implementation, such as the um, commercial agricultural scheme that's polluting the water upstream. They do not want to um, bear the burden of increased costs to mitigate the pollution that they are causing. And so you may find that you're doing this small study on one stretch of river, but that this, um, this commercial, um, powerful commercial organization or company has the power to obstruct any change related to all the work that you and your volunteers are doing. And so knowing that ahead of time um, and being able to engage with that corporation potentially or not <laughs> um, is important at the outset. And then um, having the, the stakeholders also may have the authority to make or implement the decisions such as these policymakers are stakeholders. And one of the tools um, that you can use in a stakeholder analysis is a stakeholder analysis matrix. And I will post a, um, a blank template for, um, for everybody, but, but this is some, you know, it's, it's not a set format, but basically what a stakeholder analysis matrix is, it identifies stakeholder and issues, stakeholders and issues, and how they intersect across those issues. And by do, by conducting this stakeholder analysis with a with a, using this matrix, you can identify areas of potential conflict or differing interests, as well as potential collaborations um, that could work out because of shared interests. So, um, this is an example based upon some work that I was doing in Tanzania for my PhD around 15 or so years ago or more. <laughs> and while this could probably be updated, it still provides a decent example of how you might go about um, assessing your situation stakeholders and their interests and where these interests might lead to conflict or to consensus. And it's important to think about conflict positively, like I said, as a source of energy rather than as a negative that drains or consumes energy, even though it might feel that way a lot of the time. And um, that these differing values and conflicting needs or wants may be grounded in historical relationships, in power imbalances and challenges, and understanding those contexts, that history and, and those power imbalances is important to success in your citizen science project. Um, and it's also important to ensure that volunteers have an opportunity to learn about these contexts as well. So if you look at this, um, this matrix, I've 
outlined here, I, I work with local Maasai pastoralists, um, livestock herders. And so um, there's, there's an organization, African Wildlife Foundation, and then um, I also selected tour operators as something to highlight here. Um, Maasai pastoralists may be most interested in, in food security. You know, that's something that they are, that is core to their survival is, is food security and um, herding their livestock or growing, growing their crops. Um, where African Wildlife Foundation is interest, most interested in wildlife preservation. And so this sets up a little bit of a, not a little bit, a lot <laughs> of a foundation for conflict between these two groups, the local Maasai pastoralists and the African Wildlife Foundation, as they both see the landscape as um, the provider of different resources. For people, it's food resources. For AWF, it is wildlife resources. And if you use space for growing food and herding livestock, then that may be seen as space that is taken away from wildlife. And so um, this is just one relationship that I've hired here. And also you have tour operators in the mix who are interested in tourism and recreation and taking tourists to this place. And so um, that may work well with the African Wildlife Foundation's wildlife preservation, because you know tourists typically want to see a lot of wildlife, but they may not want to see a lot of agriculture, and it, that's at least the perspective of um, some organizations. And so, you can see how you can you can work through as you check out the interests. And X here could be either um, a positive relationship or or a negative. This is just indicating interest, and it takes a, another deep deeper dive into the relationships between these markings to tease out where those potential conflicts or commonalities of interest may exist. So understanding issues and defining roles, it's, you need to think about um, how each party or each stakeholder describes their issues and perspectives. Um, how the issues differ across these power differentials. In the last slide, it was, it's definitely the, the conservation organizations that have more power than people do. Um, and so that power differential is something that was very important to my dissertation work. Um, are there external or secondary issues that can affect these processes and outcomes? And think about your role and agenda in the issue and processes and how your citizen science volunteers contribute, whether actively in collecting data and information, or are they also potential active agents of change? And that might change over time. Um, stakeholder, identifying stakeholder gaps, um, is part of the purpose of a stakeholder analysis and it helps you to approach and engage these stakeholders to involve them as partners rather than just thinking of them as subjects. Think about their, how they can benefit from and contribute to your project. Um, another part of the, the situation assessment is thinking about your role in the situation and being exploratory and reflective through a systematic, iterative, and adaptive self-reflection, um, listening, learning, sharing honestly, and collaborating with people who you engage with over time. And just being aware that your actions influence how others view you and perceptions of you will influence your success. So um, the next, uh, to look at this, you know, think about who you are. And this may be racial, cultural, nation, your nationality, ethnic background. Um, we don't want to think about ethnic and gender um, backgrounds of ourselves influencing, potentially influencing our success, but we actually don't have a whole lot of control over the, the context of how people view us, right? We, we, we wanna be seen as, as neutral or as um, knowledgeable or, or people who have the knowledge to lead this project, but there often is a cultural context and other people have their own, um, their own lenses that they're viewing you with. 
And then what is your personality? Um, and how does that affect how you interact with people? Also thinking about your agenda, your biases, um, they can be internal to you, but they also may be associated with things that you've done in the past, um, research that you've done in the past, or um, projects that you've conducted. Um, and then what are your honest and best intentions? Thinking about yourself also involves identifying gaps in your knowledge um, so that um, your stakeholders, your colleagues, your friends, research pol politicians, all of these people um, can help fill these gaps and point you towards resources or um, provide um, access to volunteers. And so being aware of your gaps in knowledge will help inform you and ground your work in the local context of your citizen scientists and to build trust and affect change. Um, I'm going to skip this because of um, because of time. So concept mapping is is an important um, visualization tool that helps you to define the situational elements and relationship between these elements. So these elements might be parties, issues, activities, these, these nouns or those elements. Um, but it also helps you to define the relationships that connect these elements together. And these might be one way or two way um, connections or influences, and they may be neutral, they may be positive, or they may be negative. And so you can use your stakeholder um, analysis to develop these relationships and connections between these um, stakeholders and the issues that are presented. So once you have your conceptual map worked out, um, refining your system within the greater context, looking at um, what the most appropriate scope of work will be um, to define Define your system boundaries um, and figuring out what your gaps in knowledge are and filling in those gaps um, and thinking about your how you're perceived by um, the stakeholders related to those issues. So this this map is of the of the situation, um, but it's also related to your knowledge and your relationships. The next step is to develop a plan. So you plan for engagement of key stakeholders at different stages of your project, hopefully many of them towards the beginning, but you'll be uncovering things along the way. Um, defining stakeholders and their roles. And this is, can go through a process. Uh, the, things, the plan involves several stages, such as initial planning, problem statement, you are, um, if you're doing any literature review or research on the background of your situation, conducting your stakeholder analysis and introducing yourself to stakeholders, um, recruiting your citizen science volunteers, collecting data, data analysis and interpretation, um, stakeholder feedback um, by sharing your results, and um, action planning and problem solving. Um, all of those are, are steps that you can um, develop a plan for um, so that you're thinking very deliberately through these things. And it's a little bit hard to see this, but I'm going to post, um, post this as a handout resource for you following this webinar. But there's also, you can also create a logic model. And this is a, a template for a logic model for situation assessment and stakeholder analysis that guides goals and processes um, and outlines the contingencies that you may not have considered previously. So this is just a guide and it should be adaptable to changing conditions, but um, you need to think about how changes in one area might affect other, other areas. So this basically walks you through the process of defining your situation, um, thinking through inputs. Um, so your, your inputs are stakeholders, participants, and other resources. The activities that you hope to go through, um, processes, protocols, and to tools that you're going to use to collect information or impart change. Um, your outputs, so what the deliverables are that you will produce. And then these lead to outcomes, changes in knowledge, behavior, and conditions. And so how will knowledge be built? 
and how will this knowledge be real new knowledge be realized um, how will the knowledge affect behaviors potentially that will impact the outcomes in in reaching and maintaining your goals and how will conditions change and this is ultimately um, an outcome that's affected by changes in knowledge and behavior and um, informing all of these stages are your assumptions so assumptions that you are making in order to simplify your project sometimes you make assumptions unintentionally sometimes intentionally but for instance you may need to assume when you're working with um, particular length of river that the precipitation at that place is the same as the nearest weather station when you're when you're looking at daily precipitation and so you may not have the resources to install weather station yourself so this is a this is an assumption it's five miles away um, can you assume that you receive the same rainfall um, there's other external factors that might limit or support your project and so for instance policies on access to private or public lands might limit your access to places where you'd like to work um, and if you don't have permission to go there that could be an issue um, or there might be a strong network of individuals and organizations who are already involved in water quality testing that may bring support to your water quality related project and might even provide data so the process of um, um, process assessment and self-reflection is a continual reassessment um, looking at the stakeholders, looking at the situation framing, and your conceptual outline. And all of these things should be adaptable um, over the course of time. And it's, it's valuable to take notes along the way to critically evaluate um, the stages of situation assessment, um, the evolution of your project, and how you're adapting to new knowledge and information, and just being transparent about this process. Um, continually assessing your role and your perception of your responsibilities um, you may realize at some point that your your boots are bigger than you anticipated <laughs> and so um, being self-aware and realizing what the potential implications are of your work beyond the the small box that you've been visualizing it in um, is important and then how has the SASA process built your success potential and your ability to conduct meaningful work? How has engaging with all of these relevant stakeholders um, at a meaningful level to consider their demands, their needs in your research? Um, all of that will help to contribute to um, a more impactful study. Um, so, you know, there, there are many ways to go about this process and I am only, um, you know, sharing my experiences and um, things that we have used in collaborative conservation context that are relevant to citizen science. And so, you know, this, this SASA process might reveal potential challenges for you or for stakeholders that you weren't aware of and which may require more thought, effort, or time on your part. Um, and this in itself may be challenging as you're forced to adapt in order to maximize benefits and minimize burdens, costs um, for you or for stakeholders um, for both the short and the long term. But um, I like to think of SASA as an opportunity rather than a burden and the fact that it will help you to ensure a successful and supported process and outcome. So no, no tools that I've provided here need to be used as is. It's a customizable process and adaptive process. Um, there are many online resources. Um, if you search on SASA, you won't find anything, but if you, if you look up um, situation assessment or stakeholder analysis, there are tools that are available and I will share a few links to some of, some of the ones that I found to be helpful. Um, and they may be, it, it doesn't matter what the disciplinary area is. There's often things to be learned um, from area disciplines that are different from your own. Um, so, you know, it, SASA might reveal something like citizen science 
scientists have a knowledge gap in your area of inquiry and that lets you know that you need to develop a tool, a training tool, um, or some some sort of an online training for your volunteers. Um, it might reveal that there's an oversight program or office that you need to consult with or to get permission from to do your work in a particular place or with a particular subject. Um, might reveal that there is a community group working in this area of interest. And since you don't wanna duplicate work, um, and want to be complementary, it's important to collaborate with such groups so that it can make both of your work more valuable. And these group members could even become key participants in your, in your project. Um, so use these um, revealed human resources that you find through the process. And I encourage you to begin um, with the end in mind to let your goals help to guide you as you zoom out into unfamiliar territory and then zoom back into your <clears throat> area of interest and expertise. And finally, I just want to say that um, that this process provides the SASA process and provides an ethical grounding for your project as you make an extra effort to both do no harm and do the most good and recognizing that when you use a systems thinking diagram, such as the one that um, I showed to you early on with the, with the different um, disciplinary or contextual areas of interest, you can have positive impacts in the political process by providing new information through your citizen science project. But the health and safety concerns for your volunteers, so there may have been um, some health and safety concerns that have emerged through the course of of this process and so you need to adapt your your program accordingly and um, yeah so I think talking to stakeholders and citizen scientists as things change to create an open and transparent process is, is very important and I mean all of this comes down to um, trying to do the best work that you can um, doing relevant work nobody wants to be irrelevant um, we all want to be relevant and following a deliberate um, um, situation assessment and stakeholder analysis provides that um, you know process that helps you to be most relevant to the most people um, through the course of your project so I don't think there's a forum for asking questions for this webinar, but I'd like to just, you know, I'm, I'm finished with my presentation and want to open up that um, anyone who's on this webinar is welcome to contact me and um, I will add a slide to or add my email address to the top to the cover slide um, for this presentation. Um, and some, somehow I'll be able to share my information um, with participants in case you'd like to, um, to contact me. But my email is actually stacy.lynn at colostate.edu. So thank you everybody for participating. Um, I'm not sure if there's somebody on here, one of the, the um, hosts who would like to pop in now. Thanks sure. everyone. Hi. Hi, Stacy. Um, that was excellent. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, I will add your email to the chat box. Great. For others to get in touch. And if there are any questions, we are over time, but if you, if there are questions in the audience, please feel free to add them to the chat box. Uh, maybe if we have one or two, we can take those quickly. Um, Though if we don't see any in the next few, next 10 or 20 seconds, we'll go ahead and sign off. Um, <laughs> thank you everyone, especially Stacy. Thanks to all the attendees and to the ethics working group for arranging this webinar. And we will all look forward to the next webinar in January. Um, and um, I see no questions, but we will, uh, let me just get your, I think this is her email. Uh, I'll just double check that now. Um, and thanks to everyone. Great, thanks everybody. And if you do have feedback, please add it to the chat or send an email. 
um, I'm interested in hearing about if there's anything that I missed that or you have further questions on it may be possible for me to do a round two at some point um, to add some new considerations to this um, to this webinar or conduct a, a part two so thanks everybody excellent thanks so much everyone have a great day